I think, uh, yes, okay. Perfect. No. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. We start the second day with the second lecture from Werner Kraut. So good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming back. Uh, even though I ended with in great confusion, I hope, yesterday. So um, for yesterday, I just want to do uh, two minutes of um, discussion of further reading. You understand that what I'm trying to explain to you in a simple and sometimes a little joking way is a very serious material, and I don't think it is possible to master this material without reading a book from time to time. So I want to give you some hints on what, what to read, and also this gives us a recap of what we discussed yesterday. So one very important point, which I hope that you will teach to your own students, children, grandchildren, uh, and so on, is the power of statistics, which means that uh, even a finite number of samples gives you definite information on the physical or mathematical quantities that you want to compute. This is very well discussed. Well, it's discussed in a little book that I wrote, section 134. It's also very well discussed in the, uh, in the book by uh, Larry Wasserman. I checked yesterday again. It's really accessible for everybody. And the section, no, I mean, there are some books that, um, that should be kept away <laughs> because nobody can read them, but some others that you can actually read. But this one is also here, and it, it actually has it like this in the title, warning. There is much confusion on how to interpret confidence intervals. And I checked that he doesn't put warning, warning on every page. You know, in the whole book of 450 pages, he puts three or four warnings, and one is this. That's the, that the power of statistics is really not well understood. The second point that we did not really discuss, and it's because it's really too complicated, is discussed, for example, in uh, Wasserman section 131. What is a probability? There was a question after the talk, and I invite everybody to, to, uh, to, uh, to ask questions during the talk, after the talk, um, during lunch, after lunch, uh, during the evening, uh, during the night, and so on. What is the probability? And the answer that I gave in private only yesterday is that, um, and I just cite again um, the book by Wasserman, is there are many interpretations of what is the probability of an event, P of A. The two common interpretations are frequencies and degrees of beliefs. So yesterday, we discussed the interpretation of, um, of uh, probabilities as frequencies. It was the number of hits divided by the number of trials. But I could have equally well discussed the, um, uh, the interpretation as a probability, as a degree of belief that something is true. This may sound, sound funny to us, to you, it sounded funny to me a long time ago, but now it doesn't anymore. I put this also into the section 134 of this book. So what we could have done, and there is a, a, a computer program explaining explicitly what it is, and we did discuss it over, over dinner last night. So I could have said that I think that the quantity pi, the one that makes pi r square equals the area, is I think it's a uniform distribution that's my belief. It's a uniform distribution between 0 and 4. Completely different interpretation. But this different interpretation can then be refined through the effect that I did an experiment with 4,000 pebbles. By the way, pebbles means little stones for those uh, not native speakers or didn't look it up in a dictionary. So I could have played the game with 4,000 uh, 4, stones and then refined my initial belief that pi could be anything between 0 and 4 and obtain a probability distribution for pi. 
So this is the second interpretation, and there's a really nice uh, discussion in this book, and there's an, um, there's an explanation uh, also. There's a, yeah, so it's a, it's a continuation of what we, what we discussed yesterday on a completely different, in a completely different language, but using the same underlying axioms of probability theory. So the theory is the same, it's just the interpretation that is different. And this is the, the, the interpretation of Bayesian statistics. So then there was a really interesting question of Chebyshev inequality. Yesterday there was a question, well, it's so old, it must be really bad. It's not true. This inequality that we discussed is the best inequality that you can find. It's a sharp inequality. But of course, if you don't suppose anything on your distribution. So now you can do different things. For example, you can so that, say that your distribution lives between a lower value and an upper value. If you do this, then you should not, and we should not have this used the JBJF inequality, there another, there's a series of other inequalities. This you can look up in the same book, I will not say section 4.1. And this go, for example, by the names of Höfting's inequality or Mill's inequality that everybody should have read about. So this book is also available online and there's no excuse for not reading it. Um, so now, what I will discuss today, I will continue with the story I had the story uh, yesterday of the direct sampling when we are much bigger than the square that we want to sample and we have direct access to the probability distribution by just throwing a pebble or by, um, by, by taking two random numbers between minus one and one. So then we had the other case when the persons playing the game are much smaller than the um, then the path, and this gives the Markov chain sampling. And we arrived at a real strange pattern of pebbles, of stones, and I want to discuss why this is the correct, why this also gives a correct sampling of a probability distribution, pi of x, y, which is a constant for x and y between minus one and one. So this direct sampling was invented by a French botanist by a French botan uh, botanist, uh, Buffon, in 1738, and then rediscovered by Ulam in the 1940s, and the Markov chain sampling is um, due to Metropolis et al. in 1953. So now I have two, uh, two parts that I want to discuss. The first part, again, is, the, is uh, uh, it will, will occupy us until the break at 9.55 sharp, as sharp as it was yesterday. And then from 10.05, I will go into, the, dis into uh, the discussion of mixing time and correlation times. So now, this system here, of course, is a terribly complicated system. Terribly complicated, much too complicated for us. So we will, even, we will simplify it further for the moment. And we do a simplification of this model. And what do we do if we want to simplify? We discretize. So instead of looking, so, and instead of, you know, this is kind of perspective drawing, which is also a big drain on my brain. So I don't do a, I don't do a drawing like this. I do it like this. So now you can understand that we may just as well say we have a pebble or person running on these points on a little square. They are, it's the three, I call this the three by three pebble game. So, and you understand the basic layout is the same as here. And so if the person is at one side at time t, it can go up, it can go, or he can go, or she can go up, down, left, and right. So now, if I'm in this configuration, for example, also this, config this configuration here, let's call it A, <coughs> can be reached by little stone throws 
Well, either from the same configuration A, or from the configuration that I may call B, or from a configuration that I may call C. Because I don't, don't allow, in fact, I don't understand periodic boundary conditions, the configurations A, B, and C are the only configurations that, I, that allow me to reach uh, uh, A. So for example, I could say at t plus one, at time t plus one, I'm at A, and at time t, I was at A, or was at B, or I was at C. Now let us write the fundamental, or one fundamental equation. And the fundamental equation is that, as I told you yesterday, the idea of Markov chain sampling is that you start off with a probability distribution which is not the uniform distribution in the square. In fact, at t equals to one, or at t equals to zero, just because we are mean people, we start off in the upper right corner. Little question just for, wake, for, waking, up, for waking up everybody. Why don't we start at a random position in the square? Well, exactly. If we, if we, so the answer was, if we start in a random position, then we are back to what we did yesterday, and we can go home and have, uh, uh, or we can go to the cafeteria and have beautiful uh, Trieste cafe coffee. So we start up there, and we have probability distributions that depend on time. So what we can write is, of course, that the probability distribution at time t plus 1, or the probability to be at A at time t plus 1, is composed of the probability at time t to be at A times the probability to go from A to A plus the probability distribution, probability at time, at place B times the probability to go from B to A plus the probability <laughs> at time t to be at C times P from C to A. Yes? No, 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 no. This is just a rig, just some configuration A. Well, let's, let's put it this way. At time 255, you may again visit the point A. I could have, well, I could have chosen another position, uh, another position. I, 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 in two seconds, I'll have a general formula, okay? So it's just a general conf configuration A. Let's put it this way. It is, I could, I could call it like this, pi t plus one at the configuration C, or, or whatever, what, some, some configuration is the sum over its neighbors and itself of pi t of C prime times the probability to go from C prime to C, okay? So this is a general equation. I was just, this was just an, uh, an, an illustration. So now let us suppose that there is a t equals to infinity limit. Limit. <laughs> and let us suppose that it exists. I will discuss in two minutes Uh, the three conditions for it to exist. Okay. And so if it exists, then t plus 1, the probability distribution at t plus 1 should be the same as the probability distribution at t, at here, at t, at t. So if I wait a long time, then 
I may reach a limit where this distribution is the same as this one, as this one, and as this one. And this gives me, so this, this means pi of A, of B, of C, and so on for T going to infinity, or T is the same as pi T plus 1 at A, B, C, and so on for T going to infinity. And then I arrive at beautiful equation, which is pi of A <coughs> must be equal to pi of A times P from A to A plus pi of B times P from B to A plus pi of C times P from C to A. Or more generally, if you wanted just answering your, your remark from, abo from above, it would be that pi of a configuration C is equal to sum over C prime, pi of C prime, P from C prime to C. This is a fundamental equation. It is, it is called the global balance condition. It is, so what it says is that the probability at any configuration C must be equal to the probability configuration, to the probability of, conf of neighboring configurations or configurations that can, that can be accessed or that can access C times the probability to go from C prime to C. So this condition is one of three necessary conditions for a t equals to infinity limit to exist for existence of t going to infinity limit uh, such that this limit is given by the probability distribution pi of A, B, C on the 9 configuration. Let me give you one more interpretation. So this here, this pi of C, pi of C prime, this is, <coughs> this is the input. This is, what we, this, is the, this is the distribution that we want to sample. That we want to have. So in our case, this is the we want to have a uniform distribution uh, on the nine sides of the three by three pebble game, right? This is what we want to have. Right? We want to have a uniform distribution, and in order to have this uniform distribution, pi of c is simply a constant for all uh, configuration c. But more generally, this is the distribution we want to sample. Object or the distribution to be to sample. Sample, again, as discussed yesterday, simply means obtain examples of the distribution. This is where the name sample comes from. So this, later on, this will be the Boltzmann distribution in our physics, statistical physics in our phys statistical physics uh, context, or later on, because we are in a, in, a, in a session 
in doing the three weeks, you will do a lot of quantum physics. Also, the, yesterday there was already a question on what happens in quantum systems. So in quantum systems, this will be the diagonal density matrix. Oof. You see how we can move in five minutes from people playing and completely nice uh, objects to things that we may not completely understand, like the diagonal density matrix. So this is the physics part of what we are discussing here. And as you can, you could read it up there, I'm talking, I'm, I'm giving lectures on Monte Carlo algorithms. So the Monte Carlo algorithm is this thing here. This is the Monte Carlo algorithm. So the Monte Carlo algorithm has to satisfy the necessary condition that the, the, uh, the probability the, has to, to satisfy this necessary global balance condition that, um, uh, that you, I wrote here. I, I will give you more uh, information very soon. Yes? Speak up. You are a young man. You, can, okay. you have power. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I pay you a coffee. So this is a, I pay you a coffee, okay? I pay you coffee at 9 o'clock. <laughs> All right? So the, why is this a condition? Well, because I call it a condition, but it is a condition on the Monte Carlo algorithm to convert so, so that the, uh, the, the, the distribution pi of t converges, you know, so this, this is the condition that pi of t converges to pi for t going to infinity. This is the condition that I have to propose. I, have, I can check, we will have a few algorithms uh, later on, and there will be conditions. To, this is the condition it has to satisfy. There are two other conditions. Now, this is a complicated condition. There are two other conditions. I will write them down immediately. So the condition number two, excuse me, I have to get the right thing here. The condition number two is called irreducibility. And the third condition number three is called aperiodicity. These are really kind of baby conditions that are very, very easy to, to be satisfied. Okay. I, huh? Well, I'm really sorry, but you know, these are very big blackboards, but uh, they are a little low, but I mean, uh, but you can stand up. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I say to you, I give it in private, so it is condition number two is irreducibility, and condition number three is aperiodicity. At the end of, uh, at 10, 10 o'clock at 9.55, when the two of us go having a coffee, we will uh, be doing it. So now let me write this condition, um, uh, let me write this, uh, let, me, let me spend a little time, it's so important. It is so important, the condition, that in the little book I wrote, I didn't even give it an equation number. Because I didn't think at the time it was so important. Ten years ago, I thought it was not so important. I thought that the equation that will come a little later uh, was important. But now I think that this one is really important. So I multiply this with 1. Okay? And if I multiply it with 1, it remains, it was a valid condition. We derived it all together, so we all know that this is a necessary condition. And then I write 1 is equal to, uh, to let me write the equation, pi of c sum over c double prime pi of c to c double prime is equal to 1. So what this means is, 
I have a Monte Carlo algorithm, okay, that has to satisfy a, give, a certain condition, three conditions, among them the global balance, global balance condition, and this Monte Carlo algorithm, if I am at configuration C at time T, I definitely have to go somewhere. I can either stay at C, or I go to the right hand, left hand, upper, down, or whatever neighbor I have, so I have to go somewhere. I cannot go uh, into thin air, so this equation is clearly true, and now I can plug this in here, and maybe in the interest of uh, sparing me an embarrassment of writing an equation which is long like this, you can see that this equation means pi of c times p from c to c, the double prime to the sum of these must be equal to this. So let me give interpretation. This thing here is called the flow from C prime to C. You understand? I have a certain probability to be at C prime and a certain probability to move from C prime to C. So this is the probability to be, be there times the probability to from here to go here. So this is the flow. It is the at t going to infinity. This is the time averaged flow from C prime to C. And then if I plug this equation in here, what the global balance condition tells me is <coughs> for all C, let me write it in, in numbers, flow into C, uh, flow, excuse me, flow out of C must be equal to the flow into C. It's the same as this equation here. So flow is, so it is sum over C prime pi p, uh, excuse me, pi of C p from C to C prime. We can call this also the flow from C to C double prime must be equal to the sum over C prime p of c prime times p from c prime to c. So this is also, so this is flow from c prime to c. So this is also the global balance condition. It's just the rewriting of the, uh, uh, of, the original, uh, of the original formula. So now, let us discuss, so now uh, I, I was discussing a, a lot uh, on, the, on your right side, now so that there's no, nobody envious, I come to your side on the left, okay? So now, I, let us discuss the detailed balance condition Detailed balance condition. And let me go back to this little example of A, B, and C in the original example. So if I write out the, um, the global balance condition as before, I had that pi of A times P from A to A plus pi of A times P from A to B plus pi of A times P from A to C must be equal, necessary condition, Global balance condition, pi A from P to uh, from A to A plus pi B 
times p from b to a plus pi of c times p from c to a. So this is the necessary condition on the original example, which means uh, this one. And now you see that I have two terms which are the same. I can take them away. And now the time honored solution for the global balance condition is that in order to equate pi of a p from a to b plus pi of a p from a to c, I simply I take this one equals to this one. And, and this one equals to this one. Okay, and this gives me the detailed balance condition pi of a p from a to b must be equal or is equal to pi of b times p from b to a. So this is the detailed balance condition, and it is a sufficient condition for the convergence, or it's, it's one of the sufficient conditions together with the irreducibility condition and the aperiodicity condition that I discuss in two minutes for the convergence of pi t towards pi. <coughs> so now, uh, again, I pose uh, two, uh, so I ask two questions. So what is pi of a in our example? In our example of the pebble game on the three by three, what is pi of a? Speak up, young men, young women, loud. What is pi of a? What is the, the value of pi of a? I, I'm, you know, I'm old. I don't hear anymore. Huh? One half? Thank you. So it is equal to one ninth because we want it to be one ninth. Okay? We want it to be one ninth. So this is for for B, so f, you know, it, uh, let, you, you understand, if I put in et cetera, et cetera means, uh, and so on, so it's, you can replace A and B and C and D and EF. So this is one ninth. So this, again, let me say, this is the physics part of our problem. And this means that the algorithm, pi of A, so it must be P from A to B, must be equal to p from b to a, or if we use the detailed balance condition, then we have, this is a condition, <coughs> if we use detailed balance, speak up. Okay. Yes. Um, thanks again. I'm, I see that I will have to pay another coffee. Because, um, so this is the one condition that is traditionally imposed. It is imposed by 99% of 99.9% uh, uh, of people working in this field because it's really easy to come up with a solution. I'll do it in two minutes. I personally have abandoned it for the last 10 years. I never use it. I think it's old stuff. It's old, but uh, so we, um, we will discuss tomorrow in great detail how we can come up. I, I will, dis I mean, not, not even how we come up. We will actually, I will show you an, a number of algorithms that satisfy the global balance condition that we have to satisfy, but that violate the detailed balance condition. But applying the, huh? No, no, it's, they will be Markovian algorithms. No, 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 we, I'm, I'm speaking about Markov chain algorithms 
but I will, I will give you, I think I'll give you 13 algorithms in 55 minutes. You'll all <laughs> run out to have coffee. Uh, so, but they will, uh, they will not satisfy uh, detailed balance. We'll discuss this in detail tomorrow, okay? But for the time, using the principle of first things first, uh, we, we, we check out what, what this condition gives. Because of, um, okay, so if, if we satisfy the detailed balance condition, we have to satisfy this, con this thing here. And now, the easiest solution is simply <coughs> to give each of them a factor one quarter. One quarter, one quarter, and one quarter. So we say, just one second, we say that if I'm at A, the probability to go to B is one quarter. The probability to go to C is one quarter. If I'm at C, the probability to go from C to A is one quarter. If I'm at B, the probability from B to A is one quarter. All of them being one quarter. And just let me finish. And what is the conclusion of this? If, okay, first of all, so if all of them are one quarter, so the probability is to go from one, part, from one position to its neighbor is one quarter and one quarter. What is the inescapable con, uh, conclusion of this? Is that if I'm in the corner, I have to build piles. Right? You understand? I have to build piles. So here, with probability one quarter, I go to the left. With probability, if I'm here, with probability one quarter, I go here. And with probably one quarter, well, I would like to go here, but I build a pile. Probably one quarter, I build a pile. So this building of piles, of pebbles, is nothing but the... Uh, uh, is nothing but the action in order to satisfy the detailed balance condition. So now, let me discuss in uh, two minutes the other conditions. Okay, yes? Thank you. Okay. All right, okay, thank you. I will not pay you another coffee but, uh, because I'm, I'm not responsible for your health, but it may be unhealthy if I pay you too many coffees. So there are two other conditions. So now is the question, so what do I have to do so that the, the, the um, uh, what are the other conditions such that the t equals to infinity limit actually exists? And there is one, so let us discuss it in this simple example. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So now I'm giving, you, <coughs> I'm giving you the answer. I'm answering your question. So by giving an example where you satisfy the global balance, uh, the detailed balance condition, but you are evidently not unique. So I could have an algorithm where instead of going with probability one quarter and one quarter, I could have an algorithm where with probability one half I go to the right, with probability one half I go to the left. So what this would mean if I start here, I go to the right, I may build up piles, but I always stay in this, in this thing here. If I start here, I'm here. If I start here, I'm here. So this is clearly, this is clearly a, a situation where the t equals to infinity state depends on the initial configuration that I've chosen. In order to avoid this, this unhappy situation to arrive, the Markov chain must be irreducible. And irreducibility, so this is, so I have the global balance condition that I've watered down just for the moment So this is number one, inescapable condition. And the irreducibility condition
The irreducibility condition is that, <coughs> that I may have a local Monte Carlo, a local algorithm that I go only to the neighbors, but in the T, there must be a time T, or a T time delta T, where I can go from any configuration to any configurations. So, and I write this as P, the probability to go from A to another to another, we'll go in more detail into this later on, to B must be larger than zero for all A and B. So this is the irreducible, uh, irreducibility condition. And then there is another condition which is called a periodicity condition, which is, but you see this is really easy to, uh, to implement. You just have to be careful to move in all directions, and you just have to be careful that you can reach any configuration. This is something that takes us uh, five minutes. Coming up with good algorithms that satisfy the global balance condition or the detailed balance condition takes us years and decades of life. Satisfying the irreducibility condition takes us five minutes. It's, it's, really, uh, it's really easy. And the third condition is the aperiodicity condition. And the aperiodicity condition means that <laughs> if you are at a configuration You see it here, if I'm configuration A at time T, I can be, no, excuse me. If I'm at configuration D at time T, I cannot be at configuration D at time T plus one. Okay, you understand? Excuse me, I'm looking, now I'm looking in this direction. So if I'm at configuration D at time T, I cannot, with this algorithm, I cannot be at D at T plus one. Because I move with probability one quarter to the right, to the up, to the left, and down. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not a problem. So, but if I'm at T, yes. I cannot be at T plus one at, the, at D. Yes, of course. No, no, it's, this is not, I don't have to go be able to stay at the configuration. This is not true. So what I'm telling you is the following. I'm just explaining the aperiodicity condition. If I'm at D at time T, I can be at D at time T plus 2. You understand? I can go here, go back. But then I can also, then I'm here. I may have a rejection here, build a little pile, and go back. So I can go at t plus 3 and t plus 4, etc. Okay? So if I'm at t, then I can go back at time t plus 2, 3, 4, and, and so on. And the greatest common denominators of the time lapse of 2, 3, 4, 5 is 1. And aperiodicity means that the greatest common denominators of the delta t is equal to 1. In common language, it means it, I, shouldn't be, I shouldn't have cycles. I shouldn't have cycles. I should be able to go from uh, in any time from a, one configuration to itself. This is called the a, let me just finish. This is called the aperiodicity condition. And you can look it up, look up in beautiful book. A little, let's say, 98% less easy to read than the book by Wasserman, or 95%. I mean, it's really more difficult, but you can read up the mathematical proofs that show that under condition 1, 2, and 3, the um, t going to infinity limit is unique. And we will converge exactly to the probability distribution pi of uh, No, no, no. The, uh, the aperiodicity uh, condition is even more easy to, to show for the, um, for, the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the end because there it is clear 
that I can come back at time t plus 1, t plus 2, t plus 3, and so on. So let's say the, the easiest example of, of a Monte Carlo algorithm that is periodic is one with only two sides where the probability to go between them is equal to 1. So it's just like a flashlight. At time t, I'm here, t plus 1, I'm here, t plus 1, t plus, t, t plus 3, and so on and so on. So this is the easiest example. It has the greatest common denominator of 2. And we will discuss later the transform matrix in two minutes. We'll discuss the transform matrix, and it will have two, two, two solutions and two, uh, so it will have parity. So under these three conditions, the Markov chain is certain to converge towards to the distribution. So the, the distribution pi of t for any starting point uh, pi zero will converge towards pi. So now let me discuss, uh, so where, or let, let me discuss down here in the, in the corner, the uh, Metropolis algorithm. The Metropolis algorithm generalizes or gives, gives a precise recipe, gives a recipe for finding uh, an algorithm P that satisfies the detailed balance condition. And using this notation, so you understand that for using this notation, I, I, you see that pi, pi of A times the probability for, to go from, P, from A to B, it's called the flow from A to B, must be equal under the detailed balance condition, must be equal to the flow from B to A. And the Metropolis algorithm, 1953, beautiful paper, a little, just let me finish the sentence, beautiful paper, a little buggy, but uh, beautiful, beautiful paper, is You may not have seen it before in this formulation. The Metropolis algorithm is that the flow from A to B should be the minimum of pi A and pi B. So let me just, I'll come back to you in two seconds. But um, let us first check, does this algorithm satisfy the detailed balance condition? And the answer is yes, because the minimum of pi A and pi B is the same as the minimum of pi B and pi A. So it is evidently it is symmetric, right? So this is symmetric in A going to B or B going to A. So it's evidently symmetric. Second question, can't we translate it into a language that we understand? Because this is kind of um, a little complicated. So let us translate it. So let's say that f from a to b is equal to pi of a times p from a to b. So we can translate it into p from a to b. Because all the pi's are positive. It is the minimum of 1 times pi b divided by pi a. And all those, or many of those of you who have already programmed the Metropolis algorithm, 
may recognize it in this formula, whereas in this formula, it's a little bit obscure. I would suspect, is there anybody who has uh, already programmed the Metropolis algorithm? Yeah, so many of you. So I would suspect that many of you have implemented it without maybe checking of why it is correct, right? It's like this, this is life, right? We have to advance. Um, so let me show you that this is the, this is the, the real, this is the easiest proof of why the Metropolis algorithm is correct. And it avoids some complications that, are, for example, in, in, in the book I wrote, I didn't really understand how to derive it easily. And I, I have a, I'm, I really apologize, I have a complicated table of four lines to actually check it. But the reason why it works is simply because the flow from A to B is the minimum of pi A and pi B. So now you have a question. Well, that, um, thank you. Well, I think I have to give out a few coffees late at, at 11. But um, so, uh, so the, let's say the, the, this rejection probability, the rejection probability is the hallmark, right? It's the trademark. It's, you know, what's written on the Coca-Cola bottle is Coca-Cola and the rejection is the trademark of the Metropolis algorithm. It's the trademark, it's, it comes there everywhere. The algorithm that I will show you tomorrow that satisfy the global balance condition have no rejections anymore. And I, I have all, exactly like you say, it's kind of strange why you have these rejections or what, what, are, what's the, what are they good for? Well, you understand what they are good for is if you didn't have the rejections, then the particle would move, the, the pebble would move all over space, right? It will go to China, it would be, it would be just, it, it's just, so the, 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 the proposal probability of moving, of doing the random walk with one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, is fundamentally not adapted to a system with boundaries. And it corrects your proposal probability to the physical system that you want to simulate, that means to the boundaries. But there, of course, there are much better ways. There, I think there are, there are better ways. And we have to, in the development of Monte Carlo algorithms, we have to overcome these rejections because they break, they break the, the flow of your... What, anyway, so this is what I'll discuss in detail tomorrow. I completely agree with you that, that the rejections are the basic flaw of the Metropolis algorithm. Does this answer your question? Right? Is this the basic flaw? And, and you pointed it out uh, correctly. So let us check. Let us check that. Um, let us check that our original algorithm satisfies. So the, so, uh, the, the original algorithm satisfies the detailed balance condition. Uh, we just have to go from the discrete version to the continuous version of the algorithm. And what happens is. So let me take a magnifying, so let me just magnify in blue. So what simply happens is if I'm at this position and I stand here, then the probability to throw the pebble here is the same as if I stay at this side and I throw the pebble here. So this is the, the real condition. So I can, we discussed yesterday how we can have our, what, what can be the, the, the probability distribution for me to throw the, uh, the pebble. It does not have to be, it does not have to be rotational invariant. So it could be that I throw in each direction with the same probability. It could also be that I throw in the direction plus, uh, plus x and minus x, plus uh, y and minus y. The only condition that I have to satisfy is that the probability to throw from here to here must be the same as the probability to from here to here. Later today, if I have time, I think I will have time. Later today, I break this. So this is the Metropolis algorithm. 
And later today, I break this uh, idea of the symmetry, of the symmetric proposals go from A to B uh, and from B to A. And this will be the, called, what is called the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm that we'll discuss at the end of, uh, of today. So now, I think it's a, a good, good moment to, to wrap up and to have 10 minutes of, uh, of break. Let me just say, just so that everybody understands, the necessary condition is the global balance condition. It's a little bit strange, and in physics we would say there is a problem with units. Well, because here is where we have, it's just like if you say that uh, the velocity must be equal to a mass, or, or you know, it's just, it's, it, but it doesn't because this is a pure number. So what it says that the flow into, so this is the flow into the, conf the total flow into the configuration C, right? This is pi of C prime times P from C prime to C is the flow from C prime to C. And if I sum over all C primes, including C, this means the total flow into the configuration C must be equal to the statistical weight, the probability pi of C. This is the global balance condition. As I said, it has been overlooked for many decades, but it's uh, very strongly, strongly coming back. And it's one of the three conditions together with the irreducibility. Irreducibility is that starting at time t, at some later time, I must be able to be at any other position. And the aperiodicity, mean, meaning that the greatest common divisor of the return probability, which is called the period of a site, a site C must be equal to one. So when I gave an example where it was two, three, four, five, and so the greatest common, div uh, common divisor is one. So then we discussed the detailed balance condition, which is, um, which simply says, I have that the flow in the configuration must be equal to the weight, but this is the same as saying that the flow into a configuration C must be equal to the flow out of the configuration C, and this is, simplified in the detailed balance condition, which means that flow from, a, from C to C prime is equal to the flow from C prime to C. And with this, I think we are all set to have 10 minutes of break where you can go out or you can come here and have further discussions. Thanks for your attention.
So this is the, the detailed balance condition, okay? The detailed balance condition is a sufficient condition. It follows from global balance, right? Well, let's say it implies, it's like this, it implies global balance. So what it says, there are many ways to satisfy the global balance condition. And one way to satisfy the global balance condition is through detailed balance, okay? Now there are many ways to satisfy the detailed balance condition. And one of the ways of satisfying the detailed balance condition is the Metropolis algorithm, okay? So this is Metropolis algorithm. It implies detailed balance and the detailed balance implies global balance. Okay, I think I have to write this down for other people. So the logic of what, of what I was discussing, the logic is you have global balance. And then it was equal probability. So I discussed the equal probability case with nearest neighbors, okay? And this satisfies the Metropolis algorithm in a special case of near, so we use the Metropolis algorithm and this, and so on. So this was the logic of what I was discussing. Just, just another. Yes?
Okay, so let us start, uh, let us continue uh, with this um, part for today. Um, so now, um, I just want to, there, was, there were uh, a few uh, uh, number of really interesting questions. And one of the que questions was about the logic of what I was uh, discussing. So we just want to, uh, let me just uh, recap this. So we have the global balance condition, which is a necessary, unavoidable, unavoidable um, condition for the metropolis, for the, uh, for, uh, uh, the Markov chain to convert towards, uh, to, from pi, pi t to p. But, uh, so what we did is we uh, then simplified it to the detailed balance condition. So the detailed balance condition implies the global balance condition, which simply means that we don't have to satisfy the detailed balance condition. There are other ways to satisfy global balance condition which are not detailed balance. And uh, I personally think that this is where the future of Metropolis, of, of Monte Carlo algorithms lies, and we'll discuss some of them tomorrow. So then, there was, so there was the detailed balance condition, and I gave you an example of how to satisfy the detailed balance condition, and this was the Metropolis algorithm. So there's the Metropolis algorithm, but again, there are many other ways to satisfy the detailed balance condition. One algorithm, one way is uh, something that we will discuss a little later today. It is the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, which uh, is a little bit different. So other ways is Metropolis-Hastings. Hastings. And yet another way is the heat bath algorithm. Okay, let me not write it. Another algorithm is the heat bath algorithm that also satisfies the detailed balance condition. And then, um, so even though in our example we only have nearest neighbors, uh, so this nearest neighbor condition is also, of course, not, not necessarily. What I'm discussing here is more generally the convergence of Markov chains on a graph. So we have uh, connections, uh, we have a discrete system with, with uh, sides A or B. If they're connected, then there is an edge on the graph. If they're not connected, then they are not connected. So this was very general for, uh, for, the, um, for, the, for the convergence of discrete systems on a graph. And, but then we saw that it is, can be, it's really easy also to generalize it for continuous systems. So this was the logic of what I was discussing. And let, just, let me say that the global balance condition means the flow into a configuration must be equal to the flow. So this is what we wrote down here. The flow into a configuration must be equal to the flow out of the configuration, or the flow into the configuration must be equal to the statistical weight of a configuration. See. So now we have three really simple conditions to uh, so that our Markov chain converges towards the probability distribution pi. So pi may be uh, pi may be the Boltzmann distribution, or it may be the uh, uh, the partition function of the standard model. It can be anything, and we can go home because now we have this, we have the detailed we know the detailed balance uh, algorithm. We know the Metropolis algorithm, and we can go home and solve any problem in physics and, uh, because this is a very general algorithm, and so there would, not be, there would be not no room and no employment for anybody not using the Metropolis algorithm because it can solve any problem in the world. This cannot be completely true. What I'm telling you is it cannot be true, and the reason is um, what we have to discuss now is on what, what is the time scale Times, okay, okay, what are the times on which, so how do we converge from the configuration pi t to pi? So this is assured, so this is okay, this will happen, but when? When will this happen? When will we converge? 
And this is the more, more general subject of what is called mixing times and correlation times. <laughs> and I also discuss, so this, this will lead me to the discussion of the transfer matrix. I call this the transfer matrix, but it could also be called the, in, in, uh, in this book and many other books, this is called the transition matrix. Okay, so let me discuss mixing times. Um, so the mixing time is the following. Uh, this is a, also a subject that uh, many of you will not have heard about, but this is the real, the real critical, the real time on which uh, which we um, uh, that is uh, that is used to to quantify the convergence of a Markov chain towards pi. So it is clear that at t equals to zero in our little three by three game, pi of t, pi of t equals to zero was one here and zero everywhere else. At time t equals to one, so if we start in the upper right corner, at t equals to one, if we start in the upper right corner, then this one will be even equal to one half. This one will be one quarter. This one will be one quarter. And it will be zero, 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 zero here. And we already have, we have proven, we know, that in the limit, so at t going to infinity, we have actually proven that the Markov chain will converge to this probability distribution. Now, it would be interesting to quantify the difference between pi of t and pi, which is the same as pi of t going to infinity. And the way this is done is with a, with a quantity which is called the total variation distance called TVD, and the total variation distance is between pi t and pi, written like this, <coughs> is given by one half the sum over all sides a of the absolute value of pi t of a minus pi of a. So this is the definition. This is, uh, I realize that uh, there are not many people uh, in physics at least discussing uh, mixing times or this discussing this total variation distance. You can look it up in the, in the book by Levin and Paris, which is called Markov Chain and Mixing Times, uh, appropriate to, to the subject I'm discussing here. And also uh, in uh, a real nice article by a famous um, stati uh, statistician, uh, Percy Diaconis, in the mathematics of mixing things up. So the word mixing comes here and it's, uh, it's, it's, I will go it, I'll show it right now. So this, um, this total variation distance, it has a diff, uh, has a, has another, it can be expressed as, an, uh, as another. 
in another way, it's the maximum of the subsets A of, uh, let me do it simply, one, two, three, four, on the nine sides uh, of the, so you can have uh, this, this uh, so this is nine sides, and uh, so the maximum of the pi t of A minus pi of A. This is the same. So what I mean by what I mean by this equation is you can take um, uh, you can take as a set, for example, uh, configuration number one. Okay. Uh, so let let me give numbers to these sides here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then what I'm doing here is I'm taking all kinds of uh, ensemble of sites. And for example, I take site number nine. And in pi t equals to zero, this is probability has one. And here it has one ninth. So this could be, so this must be larger than eight ninths at t equals to zero. <laughs> But I could also take, so these are subsets of configuration space. So just as an example, I take as a subset A is the set made up of configuration nine. Okay, if it's only configuration nine, then at t equals to zero, the difference between the two is one minus one ninth is equal to eight ninths. So this is eight ninths. Or I can take the subsets at prime being one, two, three, up to eight, okay? And lo and behold, it would be one ninth minus zero plus one ninth minus zero plus one ninth, one ninth, one ninth, one ninth, one ninth, one ninth. So it would also be um, eight ninths here. And the reason why <laughs> there is a factor one half is they are always, so there's, here you, I can partition the sets, the, the, the subsets, or I can partition the configurations into these configurations on which pi of t equals to zero is larger than pi, and the set of configuration where pi of t equals to zero is smaller than pi. So now it is, um, it is clear, or it is, uh, it, is, uh, it is a true fact, this is the convergence. There is a convergence theorem that I don't want to, uh, want to prove. There is a convergence theorem that you can, disc that can you see in the, these uh, two references, which shows that the total variation distance go, um, behaves behaves like a constant to, a small constant to the power t, and it will go to zero for t going to infinity. So this total variation distance <laughs> at t equals to zero, in our case, it starts at eight ninths, and it becomes exponentially smaller as time continues, and it will go to zero. And now, what is called the mixing time which is called T mix which depends on a parameter epsilon is the time is the time such that the total variation distance is equal or smaller is equal to epsilon 
Excuse me? No, it's, it's equal to epsilon. It's equal to epsilon, and it will be... Oh. Here, this greater than... Well, in fact, it is equal... In fact, it is equal to 8 ninths. But I said it's the maximum of all the subsets of the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And I just showed two examples. One example was the subset configuration 9. And one example was the subset 1, 2, 3, 4, 8. So these were two examples where the, this distance was 8, 9. So I said the total variation distance must be larger than 8, 9. But in fact, it is equal to 8, 9. Huh? At later times, so at the next time, we can do it at t equals to 1. I can even compute it what it is. So at t equals to 1, in fact, this total variation distance, you take, you separate, as I say, you partition your, your the, the, you take the set of all the configurations on, on which at time t, the uh, probability is larger than what it should be in the t going to infinity limit. And if you sum this up, then you'll get this total, this is the total variation distance. So let's do it. So at t equals to 1, it is, uh, the set is these three sites are larger, uh, have larger probability at t equals to 1 than at t equals to infinity. So the total variation at the distance at time, at time equals to 1 is one half plus one quarter plus uh, one quarter minus three ninths. So it's one minus three ninths, and this makes two thirds. So in one step, Please control me whether I'm, uh, I'm correct. So in one step, I have gone from eight ninths to two thirds. No, 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 no. I'm saying that, oh, yeah, so this is at t equals to, no, no, this was the example at t equals to zero. Okay? At t equals to zero, it's eight ninths. We just computed at t equals to one, it is uh, six ninths, and then it continues and goes exponentially to zero, to be zero only at t equals to infinity. So excuse me, I, I didn't, it was, this wasn't clear. So at t equals to zero, it's eight ninths. At t equals to one, it is six ninths. And then it will go to zero for t going to infinity. Excuse me, I wasn't clear. Yes? No, it's C is, um, it's, it's, it should be one, it, if it's, it's smaller than one. Okay, it's a, it's a constant, with a constant smaller than one. So then, okay, so this is the, yes? No, no, so I'm saying that the, that the total variation distance, so the, di the difference between the two distributions starts at eight ninths, six ninths, and then, and then later on it will, it will get. Okay, so now I define a level. So this is, this is the total variation distance. It starts in our case, eight nines in, in more, uh, normally it, sta it starts in the value uh, uh, below, at, at one or below one. And then as time continues, it will go exponentially to zero. And then I define a value of epsilon, which is arbitrary, but must be smaller than one half. For example, people usually use one quarter. And then they say, at the moment at which I have reached one quarter, 
I have the T mixing time of one quarter. Okay? Yes. Yes. Then that's why I used to have a smaller than epsilon. Okay. So where, where the value of epsilon is reached for the first time, that's what I want to say. Where the value of epsilon is reached for the first time. So this is the mixing time, <laughs> and um, it has um, it is an uh, it is important concept, and it also shows that now now let me give it, go show this means that there may be a set of configurations, and the difference in the probably the total probability on the, on this set for uh, for the uh, the difference between uh, the, the, the 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 corrections to the infinite time limit is at most epsilon for the whole set. This is what is written here. So this is, as I said, this, uh, uh, this is the mixing time. So now the mixing time, as I have de uh, written, depends on pi zero. This is the second point. It may, so we may be able to choose a starting point of our, of our Markov chain that may uh, be more convenient than starting up in the lower, in the upper right corner. So, for example, starting in the middle may buy us some time. And the true, normally, the mixing time is defined as a function of pi zero, but it can also be defined as the, as the time at which I reach a total variation distance of epsilon for the worst possible initial condition. So mixing times can be defined. as a function of a starting config configuration or for the worst initial configuration. <laughs> okay, so after having done this, let us go into the more canonical way of discussing Convergence of Markov chains. The more canonical def definition of, of the convergence is the correlation time. So this was mixing time. Now we do correlation times. So in order to write the correlation to, uh, to, uh, to, to in order to this, we have to dis discuss the transfer matrix. Yes? Because this is the fundamental, I haven't really asked, uh, this was invented by, uh, people I know, I haven't asked them why they call it the mixing time and why they even put it into their, they say it's just a definition, but this is really the, this is really the, the fundamental time where the uh, initial probability distribution pi t equals to zero mixes or kind of goes into pi. This is what is, what is described. So the idea is really you start off your Markov chain calculation from a distribution which is not the equilibrium distribution, which is not pi. This is the point I want to, because what I'm now doing is watering down this, um, this concept. So you, the initial, but there was a, there was a remark uh, just, uh, just before, the initial point of your simulation is not a random point taken from pi. So we started on the upper right corner because we did not know to sample. So this is how, this is really actually means how the, the starting configuration goes into um, uh, So I don't know what, what, um, what, what more to say, but then there is another concept which is called the transfer matrix. And the tra transfer matrix, let me, let's call it P, is simply the matrix of all <laughs> 
the probabilities to go from site A, one, uh, uh, from site uh, A to site B. Let me write it down. The transfer matrix is simply the matrix of all, as I said, of the, the, the moving probabilities. So this is, for example, this is element one, one of the transfer matrix, which is the probability to move from site one to site one. So this probability is equal to two, two quarters. So the probability, if I'm on configuration one, the probability to stay at configuration one is equal to one half, because if I'm down here, I have a rejection probability of one half. Follow? Okay? So if I'm on site one, from one, and the probability to go from to site two, the probability is one. One quarter. So one quarter is the probability to move from one to two. Zero is the probability to go from one to three, because we did not allow periodic boundary conditions. And then probability one to four is one, and the others are zero. Let me do it from, from two. So the probability from two to one is equal to one. The probability from two to two is equal to one. Two to three is one. Two to four is zero. One, zero, 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 and so on. So this, <laughs> this, trans this matrix here encapsulates all information on the Markov chain algorithm. Okay? And this is a matrix with uh, uh, all positive. Uh, so now, uh, uh, elements, and now what I can say, what is uh, it's clear that pi of t is given by the transform matrix applied to pi of t. So for example, if I apply it to the element, so if now I start at zero, one, no, no, let's stay in our example. It's going to be one half, one quarter, zero, zero, one quarter. Okay? And uh, so this is one example. And if I apply the transfer matrix on pi, then I have again pi. Let's check this. Pi is one ninth, one ninth, one ninth, one ninth, one ninth, one ninth. Applying this to this is Two one 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 ninth one 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 ninth. So we see uh, we see explicitly that multiplying one ninth with the transfer matrix is um, equals to to pi. So this means that the t equals to infinity solution. So pi of t going to infinity, which is given by pi. In our example, one ninth one ninth and one ninth is an, in fact, it is the eigen vector of <coughs> uh, the transfer matrix P with, I'm moving away, with eigenvalue equals to one. <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> and what we discussed, uh, what we discussed in before the break, the three conditions, the global balance condition, or here the the detailed global detailed balance condition, the global balance condition, the irreducibility and um, the um, a periodicity conditions uh, are, are under these conditions one, two, three. Pi is the only eigenvector of P with eigenvalue. Uh, with eigenvalue one. In fact, with eigenvalue of uh, absolute value, with lambda absolute value is equal to one. All the other eigenvalues are smaller in absolute value than one. So now, uh, it is clear that uh, pi of t plus two is equal to pi to p to the power two of um, of pi of t. So if I'm so if pi t plus one is equal to p pi t, then applying p to pi p, pi t plus one gives us pi t plus two is pi squared to pi t, and the irreducibility and aperiodicity conditions uh, mean that there is a value of t or of, of t that such that pi p to the t is a matrix with all positive uh, entries. Let me discuss this. Uh, we discussed before that we have to have the probability to, uh, we have to have a, a finite probability to go from any site to any site, maybe not in one time step, but in two time steps or in three time steps and so on. So the transfer matrix P is non-zero for all the sites from, that are connected in one time step. So pi of one, two is non-zero because I can go in one step, uh, P, uh, P one, two is uh, non-zero because I can go in one time step from, from site one to site two. I go and go from here to here. And then if, I'm, uh, if I compute uh, p, uh, pi, uh, p uh, squared, p three to the power three, p to the power four, and so on, this gives me is non-zero for all the sites that I can connect in four steps. And there is a time t under these two conditions such that this matrix the p to the power of t is an all positive matrix. Now let us discuss um, convergence times. And then, yes, excuse me? Uh, I think so. Yes, p to the, in the limit of going to infinity, the matrix itself will be, uh, it will, you'll have a probability one ninth to go from anywhere to everywhere else. <laughs> I haven't thought about, thanks for the question, I haven't thought about it. How can there be no negative entries? There are no negative entries. There is no, so this is a, this must be a, it must be a, positive, uh, it must be a positive matrix because it's either the, because it probably, so then if you square it and so on, it's also uh, all positive. 
the eigenvalues under the detailed balance condition, the eigenvalues of, uh, are all, uh, are all uh, real eigenvalues. If you use the global balance condition, then the eigenvalues can be um, complex. And this creates a lot of problem, and this is one of the many reasons why uh, algorithms that satisfy the global balance condition but not the detailed balance condition uh, have not been studied a lot. But this will change uh, very much. So now let us look at the... F yes? That's what I'm saying. Of pi? No. I no. Yes. So all the elements will be non zero, which means that in a certain number of steps, I will go from any side to any side else. The main property that we should concentrate uh, before discussing other things is that there is one eigenvalue of this transfer matrix. Um, there's one eigenvector of this transfer matrix, uh, the, the, which, has, which has eigenvalue one. It's the only eigenvalue of absolute value of one, and this is the stationary solution, which is pi. No, all the entries of the stationary solutions are pi. It's pi is, in our case, it's one ninth, one ninth, one ninth. No, it is, this is what we imposed. This is what we imposed. In a more general case, pi will be the Boltzmann distribution. Yes, but we can have, this is not a condition, we can have configurations that are inaccessible and they will have, the, uh, they will have an energy which is equal to infinity. This is not a problem. Okay, now let me just, um, let me just uh, conclude this, uh, this part so to make uh, really clear what we, are, uh, what, we are what we are discussing. So now, what I'm saying, this transfer matrix in our case, it has nine eigenvectors. It comes with nine eigenvalues. In our example, so, there's, so this lambda equals to one comes with the eigenvector one ninth, one ninth. And I can tell you that there's another, the next smallest eigenvalue is lambda equals 0.75, which has positive and negative entries. It has also, and then there is a bunch of other eigenvalues, 0.5, and so on. And uh, so this is lambda uh, one, lambda two. This is eigenvector one, eigenvector two, and so on and so on. So what I now do is I take the initial configuration, pi of t equals to zero, and I expand it in alpha one times eigenvector, how do I write it, uh, p eigenvector one, plus alpha two eigenvector two plus 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 alpha nine by eigenvector two by nine. Now, pi at the time t is the transfer matrix t times applied to this thing here, to this thing. So this one has an eigenvector, eigenvalue one. So this will be alpha one, e one to the one. Because eigenvalue alpha one, lambda one to the t, but lambda one is equal to one, so one to the t is equal to one. Plus alpha two times, I said that the second eigenvalue is 0.75, just as the example was shown, it's a, it's a positive number smaller than one to the power of t times eigenvalue 
2 plus etc. So it means that pi t is equal to 1 ninth, 1 ninth, and 1 ninth plus some constant times something that goes to zero with 0.75 to the power of t times the eigenvector eigen number two. So these are the corrections finite time. <laughs> These corrections at finite time, they, are, they behave like 0.75, which this is the second eigenvalue, to the power of t. This can be, this of course is written as e to the t times the logarithm of 0.75 logarithm of 0.75 is negative, and this gives, you can check it for yourself, minus t divided by 3.476. So what this means is, again, now we have seen it explicitly, what this means is that there are corrections to the eigen, uh, to the so this is the pi, which is pi of t going to infinity. There are corrections to the infinite solutions, and these corrections disappear or decay exponentially on a time scale e to the minus t over t co correlation time, and this is the correlation time, which is 3.4 seven, six, and so on. What I'm explaining here is, of course, a very general property, which means that Markov chain algorithms in general, Monte Carlo algorithms, always converge exponentially. Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms always converge exponentially. And this means that there is a scale. If you have exponential convergence, it means you have a scale. And this scale is given by the correlation time. And this correlation time tells you, what does it tell you? Well, it tells you that uh, on which time scale you lose your correlation. So now I'm expecting a question. And the question is, what is the relation between the mixing time and the correlation time? And this is, I'm very happy to arrive exactly at this point right now. We have four, five more minutes. So is the mixing time the same as the correlation time? And the answer is no. The correlation time is a property of the dynamics of your system when you are already in equilibrium. Which means if you are already at t going to infinity, you'll, the next configuration will be correlated to where you were before. The next configuration will be correlated. But then after a certain time, you lose your, uh, your correlation. So let me just put this on a new, let me put it here. The take home message, the take home message is there are mixing times and there is a correlation time. The mixing time is the relevant, the really relevant quantity. It is how fast it, how long it takes you to start from the worst initial condition to get to equilibrium. To get to the, uh, to get one sample of the infinite, the, uh, approximate sample of the infinite, uh, of, the, of the distribution at the infinite time. So this is 
T-mixing is how much, how long it takes you from the worst initial configuration towards a sample, one sample of pi. For example, you may not, you may do a simulation later on because we are in quantum systems. You may work on quantum systems. You don't know that your system has an order, a quantum, a quantum phase transition into a mod isolating or something. This is what you want to study. But the initial configuration is not the state that you, that will actually be the final state. So the time to get <coughs> from a bad initial configuration to, the, to this uh, time is the mixing time. The correlation time is the time to get from one sample of pi to the next independent sample of pi. But of course, I wouldn't bear it. Generally, the mixing time is larger than the correlation time. But let me tell you this. There's a general theorem says that the tau mixing is smaller than the tau correlation times the logarithm. The mixing time depends on epsilon times the logarithm of 1 over epsilon times the smallest orbit. So there is some, 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 some connection that uh, I will discuss. Uh, that, uh, so there is some connection that you look up in the Paris and uh, living in Paris, see living in Paris. But more generally, what is the, at least what is the good news is that um, you always have exponential convergence. And always converge exponentially, so there's a time scale T core. But unfortunately, for many of the uh, applications that we are interested in, is T core and T mix can usually not be computed rigorously. Both usually. Okay. All right. It's the logarithm of 1 over epsilon. Epsilon was this lower limit. So this is not a big problem because it can be one quarter. And the connection is it is uh, 1 over the minimum on a discrete system, it's the, it's the minimum, it's the element that has this, on, an, on a graph, it's this, the smallest element of your, uh, uh, the, the, the smallest pi. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the configuration with the largest, with the largest Boltzmann weight. Uh, with, the, with, the, with the smallest Boltzmann weight. So this can be, this itself can be an exponential quantity. So the mixing time can be much, much larger than the, than the convergence time. So what happens is the following. If, if I can draw a picture. If your simulation time goes like this, you start off with the initial state. Then it will take you, uh, you start off with initial state. It will take you a time t mix to reach equilibrium. To have one sample, for example, let's say you do this in the easing model, at, uh, uh, so you f to reach one critical system. And then you hop from one configuration to the next configuration. Or 
1 and t core. So this time, this initial time, is usually uh, considerably larger than the time to go from one configuration to the next. So this is um, the reason why I'm explaining this is that this, many people are completely unaware of, the, of this, that there are two different times. One time to get from, uh, from the initial configuration towards equilibrium, and then another time that describes the dynamics in equilibrium with the exponential decay. Yes? Excuse me, say it, say it loud. There is nothing we can, well, of course, we, <laughs> there's nothing we can do. We have an algorithm, and we spend a lot of time. I mean, as I told you, this, these times are not, uh, cannot really be, uh, be, um, be computed rigorously in, in most yeah, of our. Well, the, yes, of course, but a good, uh, we have the algorithm that we have usually, and then it's our analysis. We just have to be aware that the time to reach one sample of the equilibrium is the critical time. So this, of course, as we, as we have to be aware, so this is the time. This is what we have to, this is what we have to be, we have to have an algorithm that takes us into equilibrium. Then, of course, there are many more things that uh, I have to explain to you, or I have to explain to you. Then, in any case, in our Monte Carlo calculation, as we discussed yesterday, you only need, even if you have a very big system, you only need a finite number of samples. And for all intents of purposes, it is the same whether you start in independent calculations or whether you start one calculation and then continue and continue. Anyway, so I just wanted to say that this, so that uh, I wanted to explain this mixing times the correlation time. We'll discuss tomorrow that even if the, the space of our configurations ex, uh, 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 increases exponentially, the mixing times uh, have an algebraic behavior with system size. And maybe let me stop there in the interest of the next speaker. Right. Okay, thanks for your attention. Okay.